Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, this is an issue that I have taken personal interest in, maybe because I live in a state that has legalized cannabis. And despite the fact that our state is screwed up six ways to Sunday, it's actually not because of the legalized cannabis industry. No. And or perhaps it's the fact that I really do strongly, strongly support personal choices, personal lifestyle choices. And I realize that there are many people around the country who have medical conditions that are actually managed by physicians through the use of medical cannabis, and yet now they have to have a choice between getting proper medical care or exercising what is supposed to be a God-given inalienable right. We even followed lo a lawsuit out of Florida filed by Nikki Fried, the agricultural secretary down there, uh, challenging the prohibitions in federal law against what? Well, against those who use marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, from possessing or having in control a firearm or being able to to purchase a firearm. It puts a squeeze on marijuana users. It puts a squeeze on the FFL industry. But maybe we need to have a new discussion about that in the post-Bruin world. Maybe we really need to have a discussion about that in the post-Rahimi world. And actually, maybe that discussion already happened and we've gotten a huge ruling out of a court that matters. So today, let's spend a few minutes and go get you up to speed on when marijuana users get the same rights as the rest of us. Okay, so the case we're talking about today is a case of United States v. Connolly. It comes out of the United States District Court for the Western District of Texas in beautiful El Paso, Texas. Now, what was initially challenged and then what was ultimately challenged on a kind of a do-over here are two separate statutes. One is 18 United States Code 922 Section G3. We know that is potheads cannot possess firearms. That is the law federal law that says if you are an addict of unlawful substances or a user of unlawful substances, including cannabis, even though it's legal in many, many states, you cannot lawfully possess a firearm. What also ended up being challenged in this do over on an appeal though was also 18 USC section 922 section D3 which prohibits FFLs from selling firearms to those who might be cannabis users. Now the facts of this case suck as they usually do whenever you get all the way up to the appeals court but in this case El Paso police were called to a disturbance uh, near Connolly's residence. When they arrived they heard shots fired found Connolly in possession of a shotgun a warm shotgun I might add um, ended up searching the premises, found all sorts of drugs, mostly uh, cannabis products. However, it also found some mushrooms and then also found a bunch of firearms, many of which were registered to Connolly. So Connolly is then charged uh, by indictment with being multiple counts of being an unlawful drug addict in possession of firearms in violation of that applicable United States code. Now, Connolly initially moved to dismiss the charges. However, there were two cases in the Fifth Circuit that had precedential value. That was a case of May and another case of Patterson. And so the court rejected Connolly's initial challenge. And as the case was proceeding along, along comes Bruin. And then after Bruin, along comes Rahimi, United States v. Rahimi. That's a case that we talked about on this video right here. And this basically turned the federal law, which would forbid those who were accused of domestic violence from possessing firearms and threw that out on its ear. Now, that's a difference than a person who's been convicted of domestic violence. In Rahimi's case, he was accused of those crimes and ultimately the court said, hey, to strip him of his Second Amendment rights was premature. It violates the Second Amendment. It is improper. Those cases have kind of really changed the landscape such that Connolly went back and made a very rare motion to reconsider. Now you see motion to reconsider in the civil world a lot more when people are suing each other, but in the criminal world, it's you don't often see motions to reconsider and you don't often see courts take them very seriously. That was not the case in this situation, however, because after Connolly filed the motion to reconsider, the court took it real serious and issued the new and improved opinion that we are talking about today right here. And it's a 32 page opinion that's very well drafted. What I want to do is go through and cherry pick some things from you, pull some little nuggets out here to educate you on where I think this is going. Because listen, I think this is an issue that we're only beginning to see the tip of the iceberg. I think when we take the Bruin analysis and we apply it equally across the board, which is one of the things that we preach all the time here at Washington Gun Law is equal application of the law, consistent application of the law. When we start doing that, we begin to see that in fact, 
there is some real promise here for people who are cannabis users, whether you're a recreational cannabis user or a medicinal cannabis user. So as I mentioned earlier, what the court was really caught up here on Connolly was not so much the Bruin opinion, but what the Rahimi court found in light of the Bruin opinion, as the court put it, Rahimi did not confine its reasoning to cases involving section 922 G8. It held that Bruin rendered the Fifth Circuit's prior Second Amendment precedent obsolete without qualification. Moreover, the two cases that Rahimi specifically disavowed contain more hysterical analysis than May or Patterson do. And so you can see that that is kind of the beginning of the dominoes falling on this old precedence in the case of United States v. May and United States v. Patterson, because the Rahimi court had already done away with most of that analysis. And this is one of the things that the government had relied on the first time around on this argument. Now Connolly's asking for a do-over in light of the new case law, and the, and the court is giving him that do-over. Okay, so using the new and improved Bruin analysis, what the court is now saying is, is hey, listen, we got to take a look at does Connolly's activity, is it covered by the plain text of the Second Amendment? Well, we're talking about the activity, which is to keep and bear an arm. So, yes, it's covered. At that point, now the burden shifts to the government. You need to come up with a historical analog to show us that there is something going back to the formation of this country that has a lot, shows that we have typically allowed restrictions or bans of this nature. This is what the government came up with then as far as historical analogs. The first argument they made is, hey, you know what, 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 doesn't even matter. The Second Amendment only applies to lawful citizens. And you see, Connolly's a pothead. Connolly's a druggie. He's a no good, rotten junkie. And therefore, the Second Amendment doesn't apply to him. Now, what the court said was, Rahimi thus suggests that if an individual belongs to a group that has long been prohibited from possessing firearms, the Second Amendment may not protect that individual at all, even if their conduct would otherwise fall within its scope. Indeed, Connolly suspected criminal conduct using controlled substances on occasion in her home pales in comparison to Rahimi's investigating five separate shootings in just over a month. If Rahimi can claim the Second Amendment's protection, then Connolly can as well. I would also say that if constitutional protections then were not afforded to people who were unlawful drug users, then they would have no First Amendment right of privacy, no First Amendment right of free religion, no First Amendment right of free speech. They would not be free from unreasonable government searches and seizures. They would be forced to compel the testimony against themselves. They would not be free of cruel and unusual punishment. And of course, they would never be afforded the opportunity to have counsel because according to the government's analysis here, the Second Amendment Amendment, and therefore presumably all the other constitutional amendments, only apply to lawful citizens. Now, the historical analogs that the United States government attempted to use to prop up these restrictions are many of the laws, and they do go back predating 1776, laws that would prohibit the use and possession of firearms for intoxicated people. But what is the huge distinction there? The huge distinction there is that those laws prohibited the possession and use of firearms when a person was actively and actually intoxicated at that moment. What section 922 G3 and 922 D3 here do is they prohibit the possession and use of firearms across the board, whether you are in an intoxicated state or not. Now, one tiny little loss for the plaintiffs here is the plaintiffs believed that the historical analog needed to be distinctly similar, and that's the, the, the test that they were arguing for. The court found that the analog only needs to be relevantly similar, so I think that is a mildly lower threshold. However, even with a lower threshold, the court said, hey, listen, the United States government hasn't come up with anything so far. They have given us colonial and pre-colonial drunkard laws, basically prohibiting the possession and use of firearms when a person is actually intoxicated. And then they came up with some reconstruction era laws that did exactly the same thing. Now, the court didn't even bother to get into the actual laws in the Reconstruction era and what they entailed and what they restricted because the mere time frame which they came from was enough for the court to reject it. And I want everyone to take note of this. This is kind of a little tucked away gem in this opinion. But when we're talking about historical analogs, we really do have to go back to the late 1700s. This court specifically stated, 
Accordingly, the government's appeals to Reconstruction-era history may fail for independent reasons that this evidence is simply too late. So the court specifically found that 18 U.S.C. section 922G3, which restricts the possession of firearms by people who are cannabis users, is not supported by any historical precedent and actually violates the Second Amendment. But wait, there's more. Because one of the other things that Connolly argued on a motion to reconsider is, hey, you know what? The FFLs are precluded from selling us firearms if we answer these questions honestly. And therefore, our right to obtain a firearm, which is essential to being able to keep and bear a firearm, is also thwarted. And therefore, 18 United States Code Section 922 D3 is also unconstitutional. And the court ruled in Connolly's favor there as well. So there was not one but two sections of 18 U.S.C. Section 922 which were struck down by this opinion. Ultimately, the court's findings can be summed up as follows. Thus, the government has failed to carry its burden to demonstrate that Section 922 G3 is consistent with the nation's historical traditions of firearm regulations. Section 922 G3 breaks with historical intoxication laws by prohibiting not just firearm use by those who are actively intoxicated, but also firearm possession by those who use controlled substances even somewhat irregularly. And it breaks with broader historical tradition of gun regulation by disarming individuals without any sort of pre-deprivation process. Count one of the indictment is therefore dismissed. And in finding section 922 D3 is unconstitutional, the court stated, in sum, 922 D3 does not withstand Second Amendment scrutiny for much the same reasons that 922 G3 does not. The law's broad prohibition on the sale or transfer of firearms to unlawful users of controlled substances burdens the Second Amendment rights of those individuals to nearly the same extent as 922 G3. Okay, so the case once again is United States versus Connolly. We'll put a link for it down below in the description box. Uh, we're going to carefully watch this issue, and candidly, I think we're going to see this issue pop up in some other circuit courts. I think we're going to end up with probably inconsistent rulings, and this could be on a collision court's to the United States Supreme Court in the very near future. Listen, you may have more questions about this issue or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights. If you do, you should know how to contact Washington Gun Law by now. But if you don't, hey, all of that information is in the description box down below. In the meantime, I want all of you to remember that part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.